Hello everyone, this is Fiona Polo. Today I wanted to do a bit of a dive into something that I've been noticing more and more, whether that be because I'm getting old and turning into one of those think of the children type crazies, or because it's something I find genuinely intriguing as someone who was originally going to go into working in children's television. Children, the internet, and the horror genre are three things that always seem to stir up some pretty conflicting perspectives and opinions on how much or how well they should be integrated together. And personally, I don't think there's any problem with children watching or enjoying horror, but just like pretty much anything else, there needs to be a degree of moderation and guidance involved on the part of the adults. But unfortunately, with the rise of the modern internet and iPad kids, for some reason that seems to be in short supply lately. But that's not to say that that hasn't always been the case. I don't know about anyone else, but I've definitely seen my fair share of scary movies and horror games at a younger age than I probably should have. Although I wasn't allowed to play them myself, my dad seemed to have no issue with me sitting next to him and more or less backseat gaming as he made his way through the Silent Hill games, for example. As a result, I've always had this kind of weird underlying on and off relationship with the horror genre, and I would assume that's a similar situation for many of you watching as well. As a kid, I was absolutely taken with it in a way that nothing else seemed to occupy my thoughts, but at the same time, that also probably contributed to why I refused to indulge in them on my own until I was a bit older. And this was a sentiment I saw from a few of you who gave their thoughts when I broached the topic. But the thing that intrigues me about this in the modern day is that the Silent Hill games were very clearly made for adults, not kids. But especially in the last 10 years at least, it almost seems like there's been a shift, where all of a sudden the little kids who were watching their parents play these games have instead become the target demographic. Or is that really what's going on? Maybe I'm giving the internet a bit too much credit here for being a place that supposedly corrupts children's wee little brains, because let's be real. The internet was never originally made for kids, and instead, what seems to be happening is that platforms across the board are being made to cater to this demographic more so than they did in the beginning. Children and tween spaces like game websites are being wiped out and replaced with the same five apps, and people wonder why children are trying to act more adult now than they ever have before. But in that same vein, when looking at the horror genre in particular, while there has always been a market for horror stories and the like aimed at children, Coraline and Goosebumps immediately spring to mind, it's never seemed like such a huge juggernaut as it does today, and I wanted to kind of look into a history of both internet horror in general, and then also intersect the last 10 years of it with a bit of background on child psychology to kind of get a feel for how the current landscape has developed. If you like the sound of that, then please consider liking and subscribing, and maybe leave a comment about some of your favourite internet horror stories or experiences with the genre growing up. Did you have an interest in horror as a kid? Please let me know, I'm honestly really interested in this. So with that said, without further ado, let's begin. To kick things off, I wanted to look into a history of internet horror and the different forms it took throughout the years, up until mascot horror in particular began to take hold as we see it today. Just as a quick note, the research for this timeline was heavily referenced from Redline's A Comprehensive History of Internet Horror, so if you would like more information regarding the things we speak of here, please go ahead and watch that video because it is a fantastic resource. So to begin, we have to go back to the very early days of computers themselves and how people viewed them. Computers weren't truly mainstream until around the mid-90s onwards, allowing for speculation of how things like cyberspace in particular as a concept generally worked. One of the earliest examples of computer horror was a short story from 1967 titled I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. The story was published during the Cold War, when American paranoia surrounded fears of being watched and listened to by the USSR, ran alongside the emergence of new technology, causing people to become extremely suspicious and wary of things like advances in computer science, for fear that it would be turned against them, or even that the computers themselves would turn against humanity, as elaborated within the short story. The newness of computers came with a lot of speculation and intrigue, paving the way for horror stories and myths to make a foothold, and in the 80s, this wave of suspicion was known as computer phobia. Though this term has largely been forgotten, there was a genuine fear of computers from the general populace because, simply put, it wasn't common knowledge how this technology worked yet, and people were terrified of everything from your bank account being stolen to being an unintentional informant for other countries that meant harm towards your home and family. Though these fears quickly subsided as the years went on. Well, maybe not so much the bank account fraud, but I digress. A good example of computer phobia would probably be the turn of the century, as we crossed the threshold into the year 2000. This was known as the Y2K panic, and the fear surrounding this was that when all the clocks struck midnight on January 1st, 2000, affected computer systems would become confused by the year and fail to operate and cause massive power outages, transportation systems would stop working, banks would shut down, and so on. Obviously, we can see that never happened, but considering how new it all was, 
says this was a legitimate concern among the general population, not just conspiracy theorists and the like. As we mentioned earlier, the internet only became mainstream within the mid-90s, and also due to just how new of a phenomena the internet was at the time, coupled with the fact that many still believed it would be a passing fad, there is a lot of information surrounding the emergence of certain things, systems, mythos, etc., that is now lost to time because people didn't have the means or the incentive to preserve them. This in itself meant that a good chunk of early internet is subject to speculation and resulted in the popularization of lost media within online spaces. And what we do have that did manage to be preserved went on to help cultivate the beginnings of widespread experimentation and creativity within the horror genre on the internet. This is where the more grounded, tangible fears of computers and the internet began to give way to more abstract ones. And one of the earliest forms this would take harks back to that fear factor we mentioned surrounding computer phobia. After email became the new in thing for people to use to communicate with each other, before it became the spam-filled bane of office and daily life it is now, email was also one of the earliest ways of sharing media and content online, and many people went about this in different ways. Some people were nice about it and just wanted to show you something cool, and others wanted to see how much they could mess with you by tapping into that early computer-phobic mentality and began sending chain mail that read like, if you ignore this message you will get 10 years of bad luck and also Bloody Mary will appear in your mirror at midnight to predict your exact time of death. Send this message to 10 other people if you want to stop this from happening. Though chain email didn't actually originate online, the internet still allowed it to blossom in popularity, or rather infamy, up until around the mid-2000s when social media became a more popular public online hangout spot rather than a place for secluded weirdos to lurk in private emails. And even then, you still get those posts from time to time in the form of like for good thing to happen, keep scrolling for bad thing to happen, even though these clearly don't have that horror-tinged edge anymore. Continuing on, as private chain emails fell off as far as the fear factor goes, the rise of public social media gave credence among its users that people would post intriguing or trustworthy things for others to check out, and this gave rise to shock websites. Websites that you were sent to purely as a means for stoking curiosity, only to turn around and scare the living daylights out of you. People were a lot more trusting and naive back in those days, just bear in mind, which is why a lot of the older generations still tend to do that thing where they just click suspicious links without even thinking twice about it, so it would be a lot easier to do this than it would be today. But that said, a lot of the content on these websites were indeed shocking and incredibly disturbing disturbing in a way that could legitimately traumatize people, and it's often thought that they are the reason certain generations like millennials were so desensitized to things like excessive gore online from a young age. This was also done via jump skirt videos and websites that would seem placid at first glance, but then towards the end of a video or after a few turns in a game, a scary image or a loud noise such as screaming would play to scare whoever was watching. This type of thing was popularized especially with the rise of video platforms like YouTube, and especially when Let's Plays became a dominant form of entertainment online, were the reactions of people's favourite YouTube gamers were played up for the viewers' amusement. With that said, regardless of the psychological implications, they were extremely popular and the combination of shock value websites, in addition to the idea of chain messages, did pave the way for another hugely influential phenomenon of the internet where creativity, particularly in horror, could really thrive. And that is with creepypastas. Creepypastas are a collection of internet horror stories that get shared around akin to urban legends. The roots come from chain emails we mentioned previously, though eventually the form formatting and reach of them spread with the rise of social media, originally taking the mantle of copypastas, because they would usually be copy-pasted and shared that way with minimal editing. Once they finally made their home in horror writing communities, creepypastas began to thrive in the early forums of the World Wide Web. Creepypastas captured many different types of stories from paranormal encounters, lost episodes of popular TV series, corrupted game cartridges from beloved games, and the list goes on. And I'd be remiss not to mention one of the most prolific of these stories, resulting in the creation of a truly memorable entity, Slenderman. Emerging from a something awful forum where users were challenged to create black and white photos of paranormal sightings, Slenderman skyrocketed into becoming a pop culture icon. He had games, merch, and is even still a popular cosplay character. Maybe not as much in recent times, but you still see him lurking around. Sadly, despite the few breakout stories within them, creepypastas have been on a steady decline since about 2014 due to various factors like a shift in attitude towards scary stories, the decline of forum-based websites, and a more intense focus on video and image based formats as opposed to text, though these are far from the only factors and there are still many who enjoy these stories today. That said though, one internet horror element that has managed to stay consistent has been the concept of ARGs, or alternate reality games. ARGs have been pretty popular throughout the history of the internet, not necessarily just at any one point of its history, and a good reason for that is that the internet allowed for gaming to be a much more accessible pastime, as well as a means of experimentation of themes, storylines, genres, technical capabilities, and so much more. This in turn meant that it was a perfect place for experimenting with the horror genre. Alternate reality games are interactive network narratives, which use the real world as 
a platform and employ transmedia storytelling to deliver a story that may be altered by players' ideas or actions. For example, the band Nine Inch Nails wove a secret promotion into the 2007 band merch, which led people to a website URL. And soon, several related websites were also discovered in this IP range, all describing a dystopian vision of the fictional Year Zero. The best way to think of ARGs is to imagine you are basically the protagonist of the Matrix. That's how I like to think of it anyway. But back to YouTube as a platform, the late 2000s, early 2010s were when YouTubers in particular began to indulge in the allure of internet horror, with various channels and series becoming dedicated to it. Even when the videos themselves aren't really scary in the traditional sense, they still had that bizarre flair to them which many viewers found unsettling and, as a result, extremely intriguing. A big one I remember is I Feel Fantastic, which still freaks me out to this day, honestly, because it makes me think of the mannequins in Doctor Who. This craze of YouTubers becoming a hub for horror-based media also happened to coincide with the rise of Let's Plays, many of which were not afraid to play various horror games. A lot of these horror games that were played were often indie creations that were made by one person or they were made for a community. And one really interesting aspect of this is the SCP Foundation, a fictional foundation based around bizarre, dangerous, and catastrophic entities or events that often pose life-threatening risks to those exposed to them. There's an entire website and thriving community dedicated to this concept. The games created that pertain to the SCP are some of the best examples of community teamwork and collaboration within the indie horror game space. All in all, from early on in its creation, fear of change, fear of the new and unknown, and all that good stuff surrounding computers and the internet helped to fuel a wealth of creativity and intrigue within the minds of horror writers and appreciators alike. And this culminated in a vast space for people online of all ages to share and broadcast these ideas to a greater volume of people than ever before. But this is where in the timeline I will start to home in on a certain audience in particular. So here in our timeline is where I want to take a bit of a reprieve and have a look into the psychology of why the horror genre appeals to people and by extension, why it would appeal to children and the effects this might have. To start, how exactly do we define what counts as horror? As written in Matthias F. Klassen's Why Horror Seduces, critics agree that horror is notoriously difficult to define, but they also tend to agree that the genre is effectively defined, that is, according to intended audience reaction. As the critic Douglas E. Winter put it in his introduction to the celebrated 1988 horror anthology Primeval, horror is not a genre like the mystery or science fiction or western. Horror is an emotion. There's a lot of debate among people online as to what counts as horror because they personally aren't scared by something or don't see the appeal of a certain narrative, but the thing is, if the intention of the material is to unsettle or terrify someone, even if you as an individual may not be the target audience, it will still be considered a horror by someone else. You know, this is basic stuff. And with how potent a child's fears can be, considering they are still trying to comprehend a vast chunk of the world around them, the horror genre is absolutely going to be that much more effective. Horror itself, as mentioned before, isn't just a genre of media, in the same way that romance or comedy isn't quite the same as a western per se. It can permeate many other forms and mediums, which is what makes horror such an appealing genre to experiment with. And the reason these emotionally driven genres have so much sway and staying power is because they are emblematic of human emotion. Humans feel joy, love, and fear throughout their lives, and fear especially is a very primal, far-reaching emotion that has contributed to our survival as a species. It keeps us alert, active, and it fuels us to tap into other bodily responses such as fight or flight in order to keep us alive. I think the reason that fear is so controversial when it comes to children is because of that primal association with being in survival mode, and the collective belief that we have evolved to a point where we shouldn't have to be faced with fear anymore, or at least not as much as we used to. Categorically untrue, I know, but still. But then, this might also be the reasoning behind why things like horror-based media and games are so popular, especially for kids. We all know that kids want to see and do things that are deemed outside of their typical age range or that make them feel mature. And I'd probably go so far as to say that a bit of exposure to horror and being scared is justified and even healthy for kids to an extent, and quite a few scholars and researchers that I've seen of actually agree with this as well. Obviously that's dependent on a couple of things like how old the child actually is. I definitely wouldn't let a two-year-old watch The Shining, but I digress. We also need to bear in mind that the kind of situations we discuss here and the kinds of horrors mentioned are very deeply rooted in Western ideals as well. There are going to be things that kids in the US find scary that kids in Thailand might not for example, and this will be subject to what these kids are exposed to in their day-to-day -day lives. That said, there will also be certain basic fears that carry across cultures and locations, and I think that's also why internet horror can also be seen as quite a far-reaching force. Because the internet causes things to feel like much more of a collective experience, no matter where you're from. Looking at the effect of watching horror films on healthy children and adolescents in Indonesia, the researchers
researchers of this paper mention that people with insomnia still feel that they are in the shadow of a scary character in a movie. The strong picture or sound quality of a horror movie creates the same images and sounds in a child's mind, even if the child is not consciously imagining or thinking about the movie character or scene. And looking at various articles focused on children's developmental responses to horror films in particular, it was found that children who were exposed to horror movies were often more prone to experiencing anxiety and other such similar disorders. This is probably one of the main factors in why parents worry about their young kids watching things before they deem them ready to do so. And one article on parents.com even states, in 2020 alone, 5.4 million kids were diagnosed with anxiety. I worry that adding a frightening show to the mix would only fuel more fear. But then contrastingly, in the very same article they stated, then I came across a study that suggested that fans of horror movies actually fared better psychologically during the pandemic, an anxiety-inducing time in history. I personally don't think my issue with them being exposed to it is the idea that they shouldn't, but rather the fact that as far as certain horror properties go, especially in the modern day, I don't especially like that children are becoming prime targets for things like horror game merch sales, which I think is a big reason why so many people take issue with things like mascot horror in particular. Which brings us back to our internet horror timeline. So picking up where we left off with this, and the reason I find this timeline and the concept of children being prime targets for modern horror so interesting, is that this era of internet history is when we start to see a shift in regulation of internet spaces, primarily in how many of the bigger websites were curbing a lot of their earlier terms and conditions to make them more accommodating of young people using them. Not only that, a fresh generation of kids who have only ever known a world that included the internet now have wider access to it. And this showed through how certain platforms, trends, mediums, and so on would go on to garner a massive reception. One of the biggest examples being Minecraft. And how does Minecraft fit into internet horror? Because for many of these kids, their first exposure to horror-adjacent content online would likely be the story of Herobrine. Herobrine was essentially a concept reminiscent of the haunted game cartridge craze popular with creepypasta writing circles, where a mysterious character shown within the game of Minecraft, bearing a resemblance to one of the playable characters Steve, but with completely white eyes, would appear both within the game, but also influence the original poster's ability to document the strange world seed that they generated. The story was also used as an easter egg by the Minecraft team themselves, and while this has slowly been eased out of the game over time, Herobrine essentially reinforced that these kinds of scary stories could be reworked for a newer generation. And with iconic characters being a big draw for these stories, right from the beginning and even now, this gave way for other iterations. One big example is .exe games. .exe games are like the modern example of the haunted cartridge games, but obviously tailored for an audience who grew up downloading games onto computers instead of purchasing physical cartridges. One that seemed to have a big spike in popularity in recent years compared to its original release was Sonic.exe, which contained a lot of the typical tropes. The landscape is slightly off, beloved characters would be killed, blood and gore would be shown uncensored, all that good stuff, you know. I'll be honest, despite the creator being kind of a teabag Tony, Sonic.exe really reminds me of the Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire story videos on YouTube from the early 2000s, and honestly, I can't fault the use of these tropes because some of them were just so bizarre and entertaining. Next up, instead of looking at game properties that spawn a lot of creativity in the indie space, here's a property that instead went the opposite way. The web series Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared released in 2011 and garnered a significant amount of attention for its whimsical, bizarre narrative about how three friends were being encouraged to be creative. The series banked on the flighty but underlying sense of unease that could be felt both for the characters and about them on screen. The web series garnered such a powerful reception that in 2022, it actually ended up becoming a TV show and is currently available to watch on sites like Channel 4. But coming back to games, we previously mentioned a super popular horror character rising in prominence, and around a decade or so after he first gained notoriety, Slenderman ended up getting a film adaptation. While the film itself obviously isn't based within the internet, it still banks on that familiarity of things like the dark web and other such associations. Unfortunately, a couple of years before the film even released, the Slenderman name had been tarnished following a near-fatal stabbing attack on a 12-year-old girl in Wisconsin in 2014, and the character overall has become less popular as a result. It's actually pretty ironic in its rationality that people will begin to pull away from something that has themes of danger and death as soon as these things become a reality. Not saying that's wrong, because it isn't, but just something I find worthy to comment on at the very least, and thankfully the poor girl survived and recovered. But the popularization and subsequent commercialization of Slenderman had absolutely nothing on what had to come, and I think we all know what this one is. Five Nights at Freddy's is a video game series first released as an indie game in August 20. 2014. The overall concept of the game was relatively simple. You are stuck in one spot as a nighttime security guard keeping watch over a children's pizzeria as the animatronic characters move around and attempt to come and kill you. Eventually, after being released on Steam, the game began to be picked up by hundreds of YouTube Let's Players who helped spread the game around, and FNAF went on to become one of the most sensational internet horror games of all time. Five Nights at Freddy's also happens to be regarded as the first beginnings of the currently wildly popular trend of mascot horror.
horror games. These typically employ the use of a seemingly child-oriented, recognisable character, only to twist the existing perceptions such characters bring by plonking them in a horror-based setting. While FNAF definitely isn't the first one of these types of games, there is some contention as to whether the likes of Slenderman and the Eight Ages or Bendy and the Ink Machine should have that title. FNAF is most definitely one of the most recognisable and influential. You can't walk into a comic shop nowadays without seeing at least one speck of Five Nights at Freddy's merchandise. Regardless of how you feel about the series or the people involved in it, personally I think the creator is kind of an idiot, but you can't deny the reach this franchise has accomplished, and it's honestly quite commendable. But like many influential works, it's bound to inspire a variety of offshoots, maybe some copycats, and even some blatant cash grabs. One such example of one of these offshoots is a game called Poppy Playtime. Created in 2021 by indie game developer Mob Entertainment, you play as an unnamed former employee of Playtime Co., an abandoned toy factory of said company, who goes to investigate after receiving a letter from the staff who were thought to have disappeared 10 years ago. Upon arriving, you discover that the factory is full of living toys that are actively trying to murder you, and your goal is to escape the premises. The interesting thing about this particular franchise is that it's the main one I see parents buying plushies for for their kids, ranging anywhere from being in pushchairs to around 8 or 9 years old, thanks to the fact that many of these kids encountered the characters through platforms like YouTube, and likely don't realise until afterwards that they come from a horror game. That said, the game itself has a Peggy rating of 12, so it's not like it's absolutely outrageous for kids to like this game. Seriously, you literally can't walk past a toy vendor in a big city without seeing these plushies being sold. The merchandising for this game, especially for one created by an indie dev studio and having such a large online presence, is pretty damn staggering. The main trend we have begun to see with the rise of Gen Alpha in particular and the growing popularity of mascot horror games is that they are currently being banked on for their marketability, which relies upon a consistent, easily reachable consumer base, and for mascot horror games, the easiest demographic for this is an audience that is young, with regular access to online spaces where they have near constant exposure to these recognisable characters that can be slapped onto t-shirts, mugs, and made into toys. And all of that culminates into the final franchise I will discuss in my little half-baked horror timeline, Garten of Banban. Ugh. I hate this series. Garden of Banban is horrendous. It's just really laughably bad. And I know that I just went on a whole tirade about what constitutes as scary, especially for kids, but this series really just encapsulates a lot of fears surrounding how indie horror, particularly mascot horror, is recently becoming less to do with something that actually has an interesting concept behind it, and more so to do with creating something marketable to profit off of a current trend. It's almost insulting. Various Let's Players have even commented from seeing the game screen on the very first game that there were options to purchase merch right off the bat, and the sequel game was being promoted before it had even been created. I hate it, and what really grinds my gears about this stuff is the idea that children are stupid and will just latch onto anything adjacent to the thing they like, which, you know, some of them may do, and really, really young kids might find it scary and enjoy it like that, but I don't know, it's one of those issues where people just kind of assume that the consumer is stupid, kind of like those AI-generated artworks thinking that people are just going to look at it and not see any issue. People also aren't blind, or deaf, or dumb. <laughs> Am I making any sense with this? I don't know what else I'm trying to say. Let's just wrap it up, shall we? So overall, I think that computer and internet horror has a fascinating history, and as the years have progressed and the internet has become both more accessible and also more widely used by more people, and more younger people at that, the entire scope of what becomes emblematic of certain spaces, whether it be internet horror or otherwise, can end up shifting dramatically. And the popularisation of horror-based franchises that rely upon tropes of kid-friendly settings that are suddenly dark and scary isn't particularly new, but it definitely has a profound effect on many online spaces, and can even leak into other adjacent franchises that don't necessarily have that angle in mind. So when I put out the feelers for this video, I actually included the poster for The Amazing Digital Circus, and the reason for that was because in my initial searches, I did find a small section of people musing about how this indie series would pull a don't hug me I'm scared type trick and combine the whimsical bouncy atmosphere of the setting with darker, potentially horror tinge themes within its main series. People, particularly kids, are becoming more used to seeing mascot horror now to the point where people almost expect the same tropes in other properties, and I found that to be quite an interesting look into how perceptions of horror and internet properties are at currently. But overall, is it bad for kids? Ultimately, it depends on how old they are and how much exposure to the internet they have. Personally, I don't think it's an insane issue in the grand scheme of things. It only seems like a prominent issue because a lot of people talk about it, myself included. Kids are always going to seek these things out, so it's important that if you're a parent, guardian, sibling, whatever, to just check in every once in a while and have honest discussions about these series, who they're aimed at, what the effects of viewing them might be, and just generally try to set a good example of how to navigate them. But anyway, 
that's it from me. Thank you so much for watching. I don't know if some of the stuff covered here might be kind of common sense for a lot of people, but something I've often found with these topics is that you kind of still need to reiterate stuff, even if it is common sense, in order for people to remember that it's common sense and not get like, you know, too wrapped up in dumb things. I have a lot of thoughts and feelings on the ways in which things can affect kids, namely that I know some of my IRL and online friends have openly said to me that they watched my videos with their kids or younger family members, and also because working on kids' entertainment was something I wanted to go into years ago. So I kind of have a lingering interest from that into looking at how certain things affect kids in particular and often feel the need to share that in a way where people can choose to take it or leave it. But anyway, if you like what I had to say, please leave a like and subscribe. It's always appreciated. Stay safe, everyone, and I will speak to you very soon. I'm gonna go nap now. <laughs> Bye!